I go, the wind follows. And the wind, it smells like rain. All right, let's do this one last time. Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad, and this time I have watched Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse at 0.25x speed and found 51 new details that you might have missed at regular speed. So this is gonna be a very long video than I usually make. So please give me just 25 seconds of your time to thank my sponsor, Ridge Wallet, the wallet that holds up to 12 cards and cash. And with over 30,000 five-star reviews and a lifetime warranty, they're the last wallet you'll ever need to buy. So throw that old clunky wallet in the trash and best of all they have over 30 colors and styles to choose from so save yourself 10 percent and get free worldwide shipping and returns by going to rich.com slash canadian lad and use the code canadian lad you'll be supporting my channel while getting yourself an awesome wallet that will last a lifetime let's begin number one the movie opens with miles trying to sing along to sunflower by post milan yeah. He conveniently gets one of the lines wrong by saying she wanna drive me instead of the actual lyric she wanna ride me like a cruise, eliminating a sexual reference to keep this film PG. Number 2. At the beginning of the film, Peter Parker says there's only one Spider-Man. There's only one Spider-Man. And you're looking at him. But just as he said it, seven birds fly by Peter, representing the total number of spider protagonists in the film. Number three, it was a big reveal in the movie when this head scientist was revealed as Dr. Octavius, but the surroundings in her office, including her eyeglasses, were all foreshadowing her true identity. For example, this tentacle in her desk alludes to her actual identity, and everything in her office, including her eyeglasses, are all shaped in octagons instead of circles. Number four, in the scene where we see Miles meeting his uncle Aaron for the first time, he sends his uncle a text, and there we see Uncle Aaron has a picture of him with his brother in his lock screen. A similar picture is seen on Jefferson's phone when he reaches out trying to find Miles. This indicates that even though there's a distance between these two brothers, but deep down they do care about each other. And that brings me to my next detail number 5. When we get introduced to Miles's uncle for the first time, he's watching Community on TV, a show starring Donald Glover where we can see him in Spider-Man pajamas. And that's not it. Donald Glover has appeared in Spider-Man Homecoming as Miles' uncle. Right, don't ever do that again. The other night you told that dude, if you're gonna shoot somebody, shoot me. It's pretty ballsy. I don't want those weapons in this neighborhood. I got a nephew who live here. Number 6. The spider that bites Miles can be seen changing colors using camouflage, which is where Miles gets his ability to turn invisible. Number 7. Remember the creepy sound whenever Prowler, aka Aaron, would appear on screen? <laughs> This creepy parlor sound was actually made using the theme of Miles but backwards. Credits to Stephen Boatwright for coming up with this amazing detail. Number 8. When Peter B. Parker crashes in Times Square, there are multiple ads around him, including one for Hi Hello featuring Nick Kroll and John Mulaney. Now, John Mulaney provides the voice of Spider Ham and had a show with Nick Kroll in real life called Oh Hello. Number 9. After coming across Peter from another dimension, Miles captures him and ties him up. But notice, Peter had some bruises and a black eye at the beginning of the scene. But throughout this interrogation, Peter Peter heals all of his physical bruises. Number 10. Miles has a poster of Chance the Rapper in his room, but instead of having the number 3 on his hat like in real life, it has number 4 to indicate they're on a different universe than our own. Number 11. After getting bitten by the spider, the next morning Miles walks by Gwen in the hallway. Now at this point of the movie, we weren't sure whether this is Gwen Stacy or not, but this is later confirmed by a flashback from her perspective that this was indeed Gwen Stacy. Number 12. It's more of a trivia than a detail which is the animator said that if you pause this movie at any point, every frame would look as crisp and clear as a comic book panel. Number 13. When Miles' spider sense activates for the first time, in the background it says look out. Now I wondered why. A spider sense is enough to alert Miles, then why did the animator put such huge text in the background? And then I realized it completes the lyrics of Spider-Man's theme song, Look Out, Here Comes the Spider-Man. Just like guys, look out, here comes the Spider-Man. And in the very next scene, we do get to see Spider-Man for the first time in the film. So this lookout was only foreshadowing that here comes the Spider-Man. 
Number 14. When Miles Morales electrocutes Peter B. Parker, it illuminates his nervous system instead of the usual cartoon shape of his skeleton, because this is much more scientifically accurate. Number 15. When Gwen Stacy is explaining her origin story, it shows blue traces on the body of Peter from her universe. This is a reference to the comics in which Peter turned himself into the lizard. Number 16. While escaping from the lab, Miles throws a bagel at a scientist, and instead of writing a usual scream, it just says bagel when it hits the scientist. Apparently, this was a joke that an animator took seriously and added in the movie. Number 17. Miles reads a comic book which is about Spider-Man's origin. This implies that Peter from Miles' universe made a profit off of his superhero life, but Peter B. Parker, on the other hand, failed at it. This is one thing that makes Peter Parker perfect as stated by Peter B. Also, I was dead and blonde. I was kind of perfect. It was like looking in a mirror. Number 18. Just before meeting the other spider people, Miles' spider sense goes off a split second later than both Gwen and Peter. This indicates how Miles is yet to reach his maximum capability as this universe's Spider-Man. Number 19. Seth Rogen has somewhat of a cameo in this movie. He appeared multiple times like when Peter B. Parker and Gwen Stacy entered this universe. Number 20. Peter B. Parker says the restaurant he and Miles Morales are eating in closed six years ago in his dimension and he's wondering why. In my universe, this place closed six years ago. Mm, I don't know why. I really don't. Mm. But you can see on the door that the restaurant has a C rating, which is probably what caused it to get closed in another dimension. Number 21. The perfect Peter of Miles' universe has a spotless name tag, while the not-so-perfect Peter's name tag is dirty and worn. Another amazing continuity detail. And that brings me to my next detail, number 22. There's an ad for the Mary Janes on the left of Peter B. Parker. In the Spider-Gwen comics, Gwen Stacy is the drummer of the Mary Janes band. A very subtle nod to the comics. Number 23. When all the spider Spider people glitch together, they all glitch in different colors. But notice Spider Man Noir, who still only glitches black and white. 24. In the scene where Gwen Stacy is looking at the photographs of King Pin and his allies, the one in the bottom right corner is actually a villain called The Rose, aka Richard Fisk. And in the comics, The Rose turned out to be King Pin's son. 25. Stan Lee has many cameos in the entire film. Apart from his obvious cameo where he talks to Miles, the other two cameos are very subtle. One is when Miles carries Peter B. Parker and falls from the bridge, you can see Stanley walking by them. And he again appears for the third time during the subway scene in the first act. And in fact, if you hit pause anytime a train goes, he's in almost every single train. 26. You can see on Miles' phone that he has B. Bendis and Sarah Pichelli in his contacts under favorites. This represents Ryan Michael Bendis and Sarah Pichelli, who are the creators of the Ultimate Spider Man universe and Miles himself. And another one of his contacts is Jason Reynolds. Reynolds is the author of Miles Morales. Spider-Man. 27. The spider that bites Miles glitches out just like the other spider people, implying it came from another dimension as well, and traveled back in time just like Gwen. 28. Miles' spider sense remains green and purple for a couple of seconds when he meets Peter, because his spider sense had previously been warning him about the Green Goblin, indicating his spider sense still hasn't reached its full potential, and that's why it's reacting slow. 29. When Gwen Stacy enters the universe, you can briefly see an advertisement in the background called Clone College. This is a multiverse variant of Clone High, an MTV show created by Phil Lord and Christopher Miller who have also produced Into the Spider-Verse. Number 30. When Miles, Peter B. Parker and Gwen Stacy went to see the underground facility of Peter Parker, if you look carefully, one of the mannequins is empty, implying that the costume is already in use, which basically means the costume in which Peter Parker died was never returned. 31. When Miles is late for one of his classes, there in the projector was a very big spoiler for the movie. And even the audio playing in the background was talking about the crucial plot of the film. Countless other possibilities. There could be a universe where I am wearing red or wearing leather pants. <laughs> because Dr. Olivia Octavius is a spoiler for the rest of the story, the creators deliberately kept her surname hidden behind Miles Morales. 32. When we see Gwen in the school uniform, if you look closely, she is still wearing the same pair of shoes that she wears while wearing her costume, indicating despite being in a school uniform, she always had her suit underneath. 33. During the scene when Peter B. Parker crash lands in Times Square, if you watch it in slow motion, both of his boots come off, and therefore he was barefoot while breaking into the Alchemex lab. 34. Miles' roommate is reading a comic about multiple spider people teaming up before he looks up to see real spider people. Do animals talk in this dimension? Because I don't want to freak him out. <laughs>
35. Miles' father says he's the kind of cop that never runs a red light. Oh my gosh, don't cops run red lights? Well, yes, some do, but uh, not your dad. When he receives the call about the fight at Aunt May's house and goes full speed, he actually does not run any red lights. Another great continuity detail. 36. Just before the end battle, all the other spider people need to reach the collider through Kingpin's building. Kingpin has a private elevator entrance from his penthouse to the collider below. Can count on having an audience. Because Miles is the only one who knows about the subway entrance. This also explains how he's able to get to the collider shortly after the others, despite stopping to get his suit from Aunt May. 37. The movie begins by showing a montage of Spider-Man fighting different villains. One of them is a fight with Kingpin. This is the same fight which Kingpin later flashes back to while thinking about how he lost his family. 38. When Miles first encounters Peter Parker's suit on display, his reflection appears beneath the suit looking up towards the mask. But when he comes back at the end ready to take the leap of faith, his face lines up perfectly with the mask, implying within time he has grown himself into becoming Spider-Man. So Stanley was right all along. Eventually, it will always fit. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits. Eventually. 39. Stephen Curry is a golf player in Miles' universe. Number 40. At the end during the train sequence, Fisk's son transforms to Matt Murdock for less than a second. And a fun fact in the Spider-Gwen comics, Matt Murdock is Kingpin's lawyer and takes the title of Kingpin once Fisk is in prison. And that brings me to my next detail, number 41. One of the versions of Fisk's family is an African-American, referencing Michael Duncan's version of Kingpin from the movie Daredevil in 2003. Number 42. Miles Morales is the first black Spider-Man to be featured in a major film. During the movie, he falls off from a building in between the number 4 and 2, 42. Now, 42 was Jackie Robinson's number when he played pro baseball, and Jackie is known as the first black pro baseball player. And notice the radioactive spider that bites Miles also has the number 42 on it. Number 43. You can see the exact same costume from the PS4 Spider-Man game in the background. Number 44. When Kingpin returns for the final fight, Peter tells Miles to push the green button. Oh. Push the green button! But notice, just as Peter tells Miles to push the green button, a game controller flies past with a green button highlighted. Number 45. In the final fight, the car Spider-Man Noir throws at Tombstone comes from his own universe. <laughs> Number 46. During the climactic fight, Miles throws Kingpin from the train causing him to plummet down onto this bridge. The shot of the fragmented bridge mirrors the opening of the Daredevil Netflix show, where the character of Kingpin features prominently. Number 47. The special move that Miles uses at the end of the film to reach the ceiling surprised both Peter and Gwen. Now we taught him that, right? I didn't teach him that. And you definitely didn't. Ironically, this is the same move Spider-Man used at the beginning to get to the ceiling. How does he do that? So when Miles saw the actual Spider-Man using this move, his brain actually memorized it and later used it here. Number 48. At the end of the film, after the Super Collider explodes, there's a building displaying the words, I won, indicating Miles Morales has successfully managed to snatch his win. Number 49. During the end credits roll, you can see the Spider-Man suit from the Spider-Man game for PS4. Number 50. When Miles is still trying to figure out who he is, he makes the choice to keep his shoes untied. Hey. Yeah? His shoes untied. Yeah, I'm aware. It's a choice. But later, after he trips and falls and breaks the bypass key, he keeps his shoes tied. You only really notice it when he finally becomes Spider-Man. Number 51. Now, this detail has nothing to do with me watching this film in slow motion, but it's quite fascinating. Miles breaks the glass of the skyscraper while jumping from it, meaning his hands were sticking to the glass because he was scared. But despite his fear, he took a leap of faith, just like the lesson Peter taught him earlier in the film. When will I know I'm ready? You won't. It's a leap of faith. That's all it is, Miles. A leap of faith. So Miles Morales doesn't jump because he has already become Spider-Man. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's because of his jump, he truly turns into Spider-Man. And that's it. This was my breakdown of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which is definitely one of my most favorite comic book films. The fact that people almost ignore how well animated this movie is just goes to show how well written the story of this film is. The story has depth, tension, fun, and most importantly, it had a rhythm that most plots fail to maintain. And I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did while making it and if you did then please give me a thumbs up and grab the subscribe button and follow me on Instagram where I post updates about my videos. Till then I will see you lads in the next one.